For others, I'm Vice President for Studies here at the Carnegie Endowment. It's my pleasure to welcome you here today. I'd like to begin with just a bit of brief background about today's event, if I may. This year, 2015, is a year of reflection. It's the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, which, is, which has prompted us to consider legacies from that terrible conflict. These legacies include the impact of hastily defined borders, unresolved territorial disputes, the use of nuclear weapons, but also positive legacies like the creation of the United Nations and other post-war institutions. Despite the onset of the Cold War after World War II, the post-war period generally embraced economic openness, technological development, and a level of interdependence that would have been hard to imagine in the 1930s. This dynamic has had a profound impact on Asia, on the US-Japan alliance, which has been a big promoter of this trend and significantly contributed to these positive developments. Carnegie's Japan program, therefore, is conceiving of this past as prologue series of events as a way to put our reflection to use and apply it to some of the issues relating to our future. Later this year, in subsequent events, we'll consider other issues relating to Asia's political and economic development, nuclear non-proliferation, energy issues, and economic issues. But today, we begin at a different layer of, different level of reflection. Because this year, 2015, is not only the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, but it marks the 50th year since Japan and the Republic of Korea normalized relations and signed their treaty of basic relations. Over the past five decades, bilateral relations between Japan and Korea have far surpassed those of previous eras in terms of security cooperation, economic interdependence, intellectual and cultural exchanges. Yet the scars of the past almost inevitably continue to present challenges towards more fundamental reconciliation and deeper collaboration between these two important countries. So our aim today, here at Carnegie at this event, is to help foster intellectual exchange and public discussion about the evolution and the complexity and the future directions of a productive Japanese-Korean relationship. Our goal is to go beyond this sort of narrow media stories about recent irritants to these relations and put them in a broader context of shared strategic interests between the two countries and also, of course, including the United States. Our purpose is not to diminish the importance and the difficulty of reconciling clashing interpretations of history, but instead to cast Japan-Korea relations in a more comprehensive light, involving wider security, foreign policy, energy, economic issues. We'll look for strategies to facilitate long-term progress in bilateral relations between these two key US allies and consider it an appropriate US role as well. We're honored to have two highly distinguished diplomats from Japan and Korea with us here today, Ambassadors Oshima and Shin, who will be part of our second panel this afternoon looking at the future of Japan-Korea relations. But we'll begin our first panel by providing the necessary context for the policy challenges ahead. I'm grateful to Professors Kim and Kimura for contributing to this panel, to which we will turn straight away. So I'll turn now the microphone over to my colleague, Jim Schaff, senior associate here at the endowment who leads the Japan program, who's gonna be moderating the first session. Jim. Thank you very much, Tom. Appreciate that, and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Jim Schof. I'm a senior associate here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace and head of the Japan program. And uh, it's my pleasure to, to kick us off in our first panel. As Tom said, we have two panels today. The first will examine the evolution of Japan-Korea relations since 1965 and the correlation between political economic trends and the gains and setbacks and bilateral ties. And we'll also consider the US uh, factor as well. Uh, the second panel will be moderated by my colleague, Do Young Kim, uh, which then will look at three major future national strategy policy areas uh, from both Japan and Korea perspectives, uh, looking at the North Korea challenge, in effect, preserving security and fostering Korean unification, uh, the continued rise of China, and 
Third, the broader economic, including energy and environment priorities uh, in the region. And we also, concluding uh, after our second panel, we'll have a, a networking reception here at Carnegie, so I encourage you to stay uh, through the second panel and, and join us at the reception as well. So we're all investing a little bit of time uh, this afternoon, and uh, I'd like to say a quick word about what we hope to, to gain from this investment. Uh, I hope that by the end of this afternoon, we'll have gained a little bit of insight. Uh, overall, the main idea behind this Passes Prologue series is that if, if we're going to have a foreign policy that is not reactive, then you need accurate assumptions about the future to actually begin to, to plan and how you're, going to, uh, how you're going to approach those challenges. And the past by itself is not necessarily sufficient to give you, I think, accurate assumptions about the future. So that's what we're, we're aiming for today. Um, before we start the first panel, I just had this one slide uh, I wanted to show, uh, which is from the Japanese Cabinet Office surveys that are conducted throughout the years. I've gone back to about uh, 1985 or so. Um, and this is, albeit, one view of the dynamic that we're talking about today. There are uh, but it is reflective, I think, if you look at polls in, in Korea as well or, or uh, other um, uh, estimates of, of evaluating where the relationship between Japan and Korea is at any given time. Uh, you see with the blue being, these are Japanese attitudes about Korea, South Korea, uh, liking Korea in the light blue, their perception of how good relations are in the dark blue, uh, dislike in the orange and then the perception that relations are bad uh, in the red. And I think the current situation stands out as particularly troubling in this regard, although to some extent the fact that the perception of how good or bad relations are is not quite uh, as synonymous with, with like or dislike. Um, but it's also suggests that certainly throughout the Cold War era, but also certainly in the post-Cold War era, uh, there's been a, quite a certain amount of oscillation. And at the same time, other aspects of the relationship, if I put charts up about, and Professor Kimura has some uh, regarding trade relations and investment, uh, you'll see straight arrows going up. Uh, so it's a very complex and, and dynamic uh, relationship, and that's what we're going to uh, talk a little bit about today. So quickly to introduce our, our, uh, our guests, um, we'll begin with uh, Professor Kimura Khan, uh, professor at the Graduate School of International Cooperation Studies at Kobe University. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, he focuses on Korea studies and Japan-Korea relations. Uh, he's also been a visiting scholar and professor at Korea University, the University of Washington, Harvard University, and Sejong Institute, uh, and a prolific writer on, on these issues. So we're very pleased to have him with us today. Uh, next to him on his right is Dr. Kim Tae-hyo, Equally comfortable in academic and, and policy circles, professor of political science at Sung Kyung Kwan University in Korea, but currently a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley. So we brought him over uh, from the West Coast, and thank you for, for joining us here today. Of course, before going back into the university, he had served a uh, distinguished time as senior secretary to President Lee Myung Bak uh, for national security strategy uh, until July 2012. And then to his right, uh, our next door neighbor, uh, Victor Cha, the Director of Asian Studies and in the Department of Government and School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. In addition, he's a senior advisor and, and holds the Korea Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He also served in government as Director of Asian Affairs at the National Security Council and uh, particularly appropriate today, author of an award-winning book, uh, his PhD work uh, that led to uh, some very useful work uh, in my own studies on the US, Korea, Japan uh, security triangle, alignment despite antagonism. So uh, with no further ado, Kimura-sensei, yep. uh, let me turn it over to you. And then we'll, uh, we'll hear a little bit from uh, Professor Kim as well and, and uh, Victor as our discussant today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jim. Uh, I'm gonna change the slide. Or, or you could do it from here or okay. whatever you prefer. Oh, my slide. Oh, uh, just advance here. Yeah. Sorry. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you, James. Uh, my name is Kang from, from Kobe University, and uh, as he introduced, I'm studying about something about uh, Japan Korea relations. And uh, today, uh, I'm going to make uh, some basic uh, explanation, my explanation, though, uh, about the Japan South Korean relations, the changing situation, structural situation in the indeed 50 years. Now, as you see that uh, uh, now we are having the very uh, serious situations, especially on the historical issues or territorial issues between Japan and South Korea. And uh, as you think that, as you may think that, uh, you, know, the, you know, Japan and South Korea had repeated the same kind of things again and again in these 50 years. Uh, but, uh, you know, you also have to remember that, uh, you know, now, you know, we are in the situation we can, our two leaders cannot meet each other for three years. You know, that kind of situation, that kind of situation can never be seen in these, in the previous 50 years. Uh, so here I'd like to explain how, you know, why we are facing this kind of situations and why the uh, passive gap of the two countries are increasing here. Okay. And uh, uh, yes, this, this, and, uh, this is the basic situation about today. Uh, as everybody knows, that uh, after the uh, former President Lee Nong Park visited to Takeshima Doctor, uh, you know, <coughs> the, our diplomatic relations is deadlocked. And, uh, you know, the more I see, you know, the, even the, uh, the public opinions of two countries are going to worse and worse. Uh, we have never seen that kind of situation in the 50 years. And uh, more seriously, you know, the different from the, for example, different from the, uh, you know, the situation uh, one decade ago. You know, you may know that uh, we had the, uh, some historical dispute, especially about the Yasukuni uh, in 2005 and 2006 between Japan and South Korea. But at the time, we still had some hopes. You know, uh, we, had, we had two kinds of hopes. First one is that anyway, the situation will be uh, made by the, uh, some kind of very populist leader at the time, Koizumi and Nomhyeon. So that if the government changes, we expect that the situation might be improved. And uh, the other kind of people say that uh, anyway, we have a huge inter-exchanges of the, of the people and the economy and the society each other. So, you know, in the long run, the, our situation will be improved. We had the two kinds of the expectation and hopes. But now, in Japan and in South Korea, there are not so many people who talk about that kind of hopes, that kind of hope. So, uh, then the point is why we, again, have, we have to be in this kind of situation today. And uh, uh, before starting that, you know, I, I should show this data. Uh, this is the uh, data from the, uh, my paper, which was published on the Journal of Korean Studies in 2011. And uh, this shows the uh, frequency of the historical dispute between uh, Japan and South Korea and the territory dispute uh, since 1940s to 2014. 2014. As you see that uh, the frequency of the dispute is increasing after 1990s. This means the several things, several things. Okay, first thing that the situation of a dispute of the history of territory between Japan and South Korea just cannot be explained by the existence of the issues. If the issue itself is important, we have to discuss the same kind of issue again and again on the same level. But, you know, because, you know, here we found something happened, something happened in 1980s or 1990s. So we have to check what kind of things actually happened in these 50 years, especially after 1990s. And uh, this is my hypothesis. And okay. uh, so as I said, that uh, the today's Japan and South Korean relation disputes uh, never can be directly explained by just by the existence of the issues, like the victims of the cohort issue, demons, or uh, Takeshima Dokuto, or Yasukuni, or something. That's something. Now, no, and of course, we regarded that kind of issue always important. You know, how important. But then we 
need to know there's some other element which is influencing the today, today's situation. Okay, so I found that you know, I pick out two variables. First one is the importance of the issue, and the second one is the importance of the other counterpart. I expect if the, the counterpart is very important in the, in the kind of situation, the business people and the politicians and the diplomats will make their best, best efforts to improve the situation as soon as we see the problems. You see that, uh, you, you know, that some information even from this data. You know, the, for example, in 1985, the Prime Minister Nakasone visited the Yasukuni. It, it was in 1985. But uh, you cannot see that, you know, very high the ratios of the dispute in 1980s. It is because, you know, the Japanese and the South Korea government made their best effort to solve the problem very quickly, very quickly. So the situation will, did not continue for human rights and a few years like this, like today, like today. Okay, and uh, sometimes the, the, especially in South Korea, and uh, some kind of people expect, oh no, no, this is just a result of the booming of Japanese nationalism. Yeah, but the reality is more complicated. Uh, this is the data about the uh, descriptions of the, the one of the Japanese major textbook. Now, as you see that the description on Japanese textbooks about the colonial period is never decreasing since 1980s, since 1970s. No, it is actually increasing until 2005. After 2005, we have a different story. But anyway, uh, you know, it means that we cannot explain the uh, you know, you know, escalation of the dispute since 1990s just by the booming of the just Japanese nationalism. I, th I, th I think you can understand this one very well. You know, if Japanese nationalism is already bo you know, booming since 1980s, okay, uh, Japanese poli policy maker, prime ministers in 1970s and 1960s must be very liberal, right? But uh, you, might, you might know that you know, the prime minister, for example, Sato or Kishi, are never a liberal person than the Murayama or Miyazawa prime minister in 1990s. So we have to find other kind of the uh, reasons. So you know, I'd like to focus on the, data, the economic data. Here, the, uh, this is the data of the uh, South Korean trade with a major partner. You know, uh, it means that China, Japan, US. And uh, of course, you know, the, uh, ch the ch Chinese is increasing very dramatically, but uh, here we see that uh, some of the, of the development of the trade between Japan and South Korea. So sometimes somebody said that also, so we are okay. We are, you know, our interrelations are increasing. But, uh, no, the, sometimes the amount of the exchange is not so important. The more important thing is the share and importance in the economy. This is the data of the share of the major, major country, three countries in South Korean trade. And uh, uh, Japanese one is here, the purple, yeah, uh, purple. And here you see that uh, uh, Japanese, that whole South Korean people, the importance of the Japanese economy had dramatically decreased since the last half of the 1970s. And, was, and, and here again, I have to say a few things. Okay? This is not just a result of the Japanese economic slump, because it started in the 1970s. And we also can you know, see the same kind of situation in the United States. <laughs> okay? The US share is also decreasing. And somebody said that, oh, it is because of the Chinese expansion. No. Uh, of course, partly yes. But the uh, you know, Chinese just took 20% of share, 23 or 25. But the US and Japan, have lost almost 60 percent share in 40 years. China covered just 20 percent. The other you know, 40 percent were was taken by some other countries. Of course, the reason is very simple: the end of Cold War and the South Korean development and globalization. Globalization. And uh, you know the you know. In spite of the increasing of the amount of the uh, exchanges between two countries, the, even in Japan, the importance of the South Korea economy is not increasing. increasing. So uh, now it, uh, it is very easy for us 
to find the difference of the situation. For example, today and 1980s. 1980s, people regarded Japan and South Korea were important partner. So, you know, business people pushed the politician, and the politician made a huge effort to improve the situation. But, you know, as some of you see, today we cannot find such kind of sincere effort among Japanese government, Japanese media, Japanese society, and the South Koreans. South Koreans. Simply because we are not each other so important anymore. Now we have to, we are in the situation, have to find the reason for the cooperation. Okay? And uh, this is another kind of data, but uh, you know, so I just want to say that the same kind of thing is happening between Japan and China. And also, you know, the, the situation is you know, changing even in the military part of society. Military part of society. This is the data of the military expenditure uh, on US base, US dollar base. And now here you see that the South Korea is catching up. Uh, the, the amount of the, the, the Japanese military expenditure very quickly, very quickly. Uh, because they're spending the, uh, almost 3% of the GDP scale of the military expenditures. So even though the Japanese economy is much bigger than the South Korean one, but the, the, the you know, percentage of the military expenditure is much, be, much bigger than Japanese. So if this trend continues, okay, I think that the South Korean military expenditure might be more than Japanese one in 10 years, in 10 years. You know, anyway, now we are living with this kind of situation. So it is very rational for us to see. For example, in 2000, 2012, former President Lee Myung Park said that Japan is not so important anymore like old days. So he can, he said, we can say, we can say something against Japan now. We should say, say something against Japan. And this is a very symbolic message from South Korean society and the South Korean politicians. But, you know, of course, you have to take another kind of point, strategic one. You may expect, even in the situation of the decline of the importance of the Japanese economy to South Korea or Chinese, you know, because of the expansions of the Chinese influence, we should, but we can make a sign of, find of reason for the cooperation. But unfortunately, this is not the real situation of the uh, society of two countries. For example, uh, when the, uh, the Pakune government was established in 2013, uh, to 2013, you know, the Japanese government sent a message, so-called value-oriented policy. Uh, you know, the, they say, or we say, that, you know, that we are sharing the same kind of diplomatic, you know, the uh, culture, culture and ideologies. So Japanese government said that we can make cooperations. But unfortunately, South Korean government declined that. Decline that. Because for South Korean people, it means you know, it means that the Japanese are saying you know, fight together against China, which is which has a different kind of ideology. And uh, here, you know, the things I, you know, how we have to think about the why then point it. Why the Japan and South Korea have the very different kind of understanding on the booming China, big China. Okay, uh, I just want to say two points. You know, this is the data uh, of the, some, some data of the, to show the importance of the Chinese economy on the two countries, two countries. You know, sometimes, you know, we have to, you know, keep, be, be careful about, you know, uh, way of using the statistics here. You know, for example, if we just check the share Chinese share in the trade, Japanese percentages, and the South Korean percentage is almost the same. 25, 23, or something, something. So sometimes you know, people mis tend to misunderstand that uh, Japan and South Korea de are depending on Chinese economy on the same level. Same level. But no, no. Now this is the data to the I, which I compare the scale of the trade with China and GDP and the GDP. And for South Korean, you know, the percentage is 70%, more than 70%. But for Japanese, the number is just 6%. 
It means that the whole South Koreans, China is as three times as important than that whole Japanese. The Japanese, of course. Uh, 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 yes, and uh, uh, actually, you know, you know, this is the data for the World Bank, and uh, how much the Chinese, you know, the trade with China are, con are contributing to the, the GDPs. Uh, also, the contribution level of the uh, Chinese trade in South Korea is uh, three times big than Japanese one. And the reason why is very simple. South Korean economy is very much dependent on the trade. <laughs> Very much trade or trade. So their trade dependency ratio is almost 100 percent, right? So if you know, uh, so if the you know scale of the Chinese trade is almost 25 percent of the trade of the trade, the you know the scale of the such a Chinese trade against GDP also must be the 25 percent. This is a very simple calculation. But uh, Japan, as you see, with the United States. One of the countries which are not so much dependent on the trade, international trade. So, uh, simply because we, our economy is not dependent on the foreign trade, so the importance of the China, the China trade on Japanese economies have to be much, much smaller than the South Korean city, than the South, whole South Korea. Okay, and uh, uh, lastly, okay, strategic one, more strategic one. The last point I want to say is that uh, today, Japan and South Korea has a very different understanding on the here, your problem, US policy against China. If you have a chance to see the, uh, to, to, to talk with the Japanese diplomats, or Japanese media people, journalists, and the South Korean journalists, South Korean diplomats, you, you know, if you can see that the, our different, you know, understanding is very different. Nobody, South Korean regard U.S. policy against China more cooperative. They say, even for U.S., China is a very important economic partner. So they expect U.S. will not take so hard line policy against China. It is a natural, you know, it is normal understanding of South Korean society. But in Japan, you know, maybe you can, it is very hard for you to find the uh, uh, same kind of articles on the Japanese newspaper like Asahi or Yomiuri or Sankei. Even liberal Asahi wrote, or write, that they understand the U.S. policy against China is a competitive one, competitive one. The point is, why we are having a different kind of understanding of the holding policy of one country? Uh, one of the reasons is uh, your expectation and our expectations of, of the law of the Japanese naval power, you know, uh, for the United States, the U.S. strategy. You know, as you see, that this is a this is a very you know simple table which shows the uh, different level of the naval power of the three countries. And now you see that uh, Japan still has a very big, you know, uh, ships. You know, Japan is a very strange country. We just have 143 ships, but uh, uh, the number of the, you know, frigates or destroyers are almost 42. <laughs> we just have just two, just big, the big ships. It means that uh, Japan can make operation on the blue water sea, blue water sea. So some U.S. people expect. Japanese to, to play some important role on East China Sea or South China Sea. And we also expect China U.S. will expect us. Expect. But, you know, unfortunately, South Korean naval force is very small. So for the South Korean diplomats or policymakers, it is very rare for us, for them, to hear, to have such kind of talk with the American people expecting the very positive role of the South Korean military power against China. You know, uh, so, you know, the, in South Korea, you know, the voice of the, you know, the, how can I say, the soft liners in the United States sound lively. 
But in Japan, hardliners boys sound very loudly. So because of the different pipes and different message of the United States, now we are having a very different understanding about US policy against China. So, you know, even on the strategic, you know, you know the, the issues, now we are in the situation. We cannot find a way of the cooperation together. South Korean people regard Japan as an obstacle between US and China because Japan is taking hydrogen hydro policies. So they say, we are broken. We are breaking the peaceful relationship between US and China. But, but Japanese say, no, oh, no, 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 South Korea is going to the side of China. You know, so we cannot believe South Korea anymore. We say, you know, the many the policy makers and the diplomats and the journalists have that kind of understanding. So in that kind of situation, you know, uh, we, it is very hard for us to have the cooperation. Yes. Okay, lastly, so, you know, my point is very simple. Anyway, you know, in the, in the old days, we have a reason for us to have a corporations. But we now, we are almost losing the reasons for the corporations. But still, Japan and South Korea you know, relationships, of course, is important. So, but you know, we have no idea about how to cooperate each other and why the counterpart is important. And why Japan is important for South Korea. Japan has no message, and South Korea has no message. So maybe we should restart the relationship, the, you know, to, 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 to try to look for the reason for the cooperation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, let's, uh, let's turn to Professor Kim for, uh, to add to this, this discussion. Uh, Kimura-sensei took us quite a long way. Uh, Sorry. But, uh, no, no, that's, that's all right. Professor Kim, you can use the podium if you like, or you can just to sit and sure. talk. Thanks very much for uh, allowing us to visit Washington, D.C. again and uh, meet good friends and uh, very good audience here. Following up on uh, Mr. Kimura Khan's very nice statistics and uh, quantitative approach, I'd like to add up some qualitative approach showing the cause and effect of Korea. Japan relations, and then I point out some future challenges and opportunities uh, in front of us, in front of bilateral security and economic relations. As Kimura already uh, mentioned, we can identify some important uh, turning point for the last 70 years. I would pick up 1965 and 1990 and 2012. So these three a uh, transition period tells us some causal logics why uh, we saw a uh, experienced Korea Japan relations back and forth and the turbulences uh, depending upon internal and external environment. Japan was a uh, Korea was liberalized August 1945 so it took 20 years for both countries to renormalize their diplomatic relations. In the meantime, Lee Seung-man government, the founder of the Republic of Korea, and who decided to ally with the US, it was still anti-Japanese normally. It was very natural, because Korean people never forget the recent past while they are trying to a, a rebuilding, a rebuild their economy and the national identity. But uh, it was also a timing of a Cold War period and uh, mutual rivalry and uh, severe identi identity battle between US and Soviet side was uh, rapidly growing during these 1950s and 60s. And Park Jong-hee regime uh, grasped the power early 1960s and he became a more a practical leader in that he needed U.S. economic support. And then as the neighboring countries, President Park appreciated the importance of a economic uh, cooperation between Japan and Korea. Particularly at that time as a poor country, 
Korea needed technological support from Japan and also badly needed the Japanese investment. And also, in a broader picture, Soviet threat was a huge factor for both Japan and Korea as a democratic countries. And also, a immediate threat of North Korea pushed Japan and Korea to think about some sort of ties between the two countries. And it was a US State Department and uh, Washington, DC, who made a critical role to push and make some political pressure and sometimes a very nice gesture and uh, persuasion for Japan and Korean leaders to decide to, to normalize their diplomatic relations. So my tentative conclusion here is that it was a normalization bridged by short-term interest not genuine understanding. So Korea, Japan people was not that ready to forgive and to reconcile, but economic, strategic, and military reasons pushed these two countries to bind together. 1990, as you know, Soviet collapsed, and uh, history problems emerged from hibernation. Not anymore, Japan, Korea needed to I worry about Soviet threat anymore. Only small North Korean threat exists. China was still very slowly growing at the time, early 1990s. I remember uh, I was a graduate student in the United States during 1990s, entire time. And uh, those time was a peak for Japan. Every management class in the United States tried to learn how Japanese company became so successful. So still 1990s, Japan and Korea did not have any room to worry about Chinese military and economic threat at the time. That means Korea, Japan, for the first time, started to doubt that, do we still need a US security umbrella? Is it so critical? The alliance has been so unequal. We have been growing a lot. So a lot of bilateral relations, two sets of these democratic alliances uh, underwent a lot of transitions in terms of SOFA agreements, environmental issues, and uh, US uh, military uh, criminals in their domestic societies. A lot of confusions. And also, one important factor was the comfort woman it was Japanese experts and scholars who, for the first time, found out that this issue is something strange. They could reveal some documents showing that Japanese authority and governments was somehow related to a conscription process and management of the comfort woman during the Pacific War. So it was not until a, it was not handled or it was not an issue until early 1990s. And 1965 normalization agreement, of course, did not mention this comfort, comfort woman issue. So this one became a very a significant a litmus test for the two countries, a, regardless of the existing 1965 agreement. <coughs> the next a, turning point is, as you well know, 2012. And until that time, both governments continuously made a lot of efforts. Two of them, uh, Professor Kimura Khan already mentioned. In 1995, there was a Murayama statement. And in 2010, during the middle of the Lee Myung Bak government, there was a Gan Naoto statement. Mm -hmm. These two prime minister level statements pointed out the apology on the colonial period. 1985, there was a Miyazawa, Miyazawa statement saying that Japan will some pay attention to the description of Japanese history textbooks. 1993, there was a Gono statement acknowledging that Japanese government have something to do with the comfort woman issue and uh, let's look for some uh, solutions in the future. Then why suddenly, 2012, all these efforts become to a nearly in vain. You can remember the DJ administration and Nomuyan administration, these 10 years of South Korean 
liberal leadership did not pay enough attention to North Korean nuclear threat. Rather, they diligently tried to give economic incentives to North Korea, and they believed that this is the best way to make a new peace treaty between Seoul and Pyongyang. At that time, Seoul and Japan mutually uh, gave a suspicion with each other. Japan thought that uh, Seoul is something strange because they are helping Kim Jong-il. And uh, Seoul at the time believed that Japan is not helping us. We need to improve inter-Korean relations. So in other words, on history issues, President Kim Dae-jung and No Mu-hyun relatively did not have a so a busy time to battle, make a battle with each other. But in security issues, a Korea-Japan relations was not that good. If you remember the previous government, uh, Im Young-bak administration, first four and a half years, the Japan-Korea relations uh, became the remarkably uh, good and uh, positive relations. It is un unusually a very good romance between these two governments. Korea was a conservative, anti-communist government, and Japan, a three years of a Japan's a LDP, uh, Japan Democratic Party leadership, was much more favorable to the past history issues compared to the previous uh, Liberal Democratic Party leadership. So these very strange but uh, fresh and uh, clicking relationship between Japanese liberals and Korean conservatives did make a, made a very good job on security and military cooperation. So US, Japan, Korea trilateral relations suddenly became uh, strengthened. And Russia and China was kind of frustrated to see that very good security relationship between Seoul and Tokyo. And then, as you remember, a GSOMIA uh, broke down and uh, President Lee's visit to uh, Tokyo Takeshima, and then a Japan leadership was suddenly changed, and uh, it went back to LDP leadership. After Noda cabinet, Abe became the new star for the Japanese strong leadership. So we can uh, say and explain these uh, three and a half years of uh, current struggle in terms of Japan-Korea uh, relations, uh, I would point out domestic politics and societal <coughs> transition in both society, and then some structural international environment uh, helped to aggravate uh, these two uh, countries' mutual relations, which is that uh, there was also a power transition between Korea and Japan. Korea is relatively small compared to China and Japan's economy. But the gap between Japan and Korea has been a vastly narrowed down, which led to Korean people's growing nationalism and Japan's nervousness about its growing neighbor. So these a, relations also a, coupled with their traditional animosity on past history issues was a hot potato for Japanese and Korean politicians. Conventional wisdom has been that Korean conservatives are pro-American and anti-North Korean, and they are very reluctant about the Chinese intention. And Korean liberals tend to be more pro-North Korean and anti-American. But in Korean uh, assembly and lawmakers and uh, the process of general election, for the last three years, for both rightists and leftists in Korean society, the bashing Japan has become a very uh, popular menu to easily uh, achieve public attention. That is the same for Japan's Abe cabinet. Japan has been pretty much straighted by the Chinese factor and also, Japan is nervous about the future of its democratic ties with Washington and Seoul. And uh, Abe's economic card was Abenomics. And Abe's uh, North Korea card was his promise to handle the kidnapped issues. 
And his another issue was to make Japan stronger and to make more responsible international contributions to Northeast Asia. So Japan's people's strong support for Abe also was related to these a very regrettable incidents has happened between Japan and Korea. Let me just uh, suggest you the future prospects and also what can we do. Of course, Ambassador Shin and uh, uh, Oshima will more concretely talk about diplomatic and foreign policy solutions the following session. So I'll just uh, minimize my uh, gist of a political suggestions and policy suggestions. My first question is that the puzzle about the long-term future path of Japan-Korea relations. And I believe it boils down to a, two interrelated questions. One is, can the two countries sincerely reconcile at all? Would it be 100% sometime, one or 200 in the, in the future? Or the maximum we can anticipate is just a 75%. That is my first question. And second question is, then what kind of non-historic cooperation can be available for these both countries? My answer for the first question is that a complete resolution would be almost impossible <coughs> in several hundred years from now on. That is my tentative <laughs> conclusion at this moment. Why? Because comfort woman can be settled in a couple of years or three or four years maybe from now on. And this issue became the most important critical issues before the bilateral relations. But the problem is Prime Minister Abe does not seem to be a, so willing He, has a soul, he does not seem to have a so strong willingness to uh, tackle this difficult problem. And I also feel that a Korean government is not that uh, ready to give assurance to Japanese leaders that this one is going to be clearly accepted by a Korean public if they ever uh, agree up to some uh, concrete uh, agreement. But the other problem, the territorial issue, this is not about the content. It's, a, it's the psychology of Korean people. Whenever Japanese textbook and leaders argue for a, the territorial a, a demand, Korean people automatically believes that <coughs> Japanese people is way far from sincere apology. This one clearly shows that Japan never changes. So it's not about territory map or a 300 year old old record. Just a Korean automatic response. The other one is textbook. Korean school girls and Korean high school students and Japan youngsters read different history textbooks. Japan believes that we did uh, something wrong, but uh, we, was, or we were also victimized by the atomic bomb. And also, we were defeated by United Nations. So we have to reborn as a peace-loving country. Mm -hmm. Korean people believe that uh, Japan has some sort of a, a offender consciousness and victim consciousness normally toward the Western society. And Japan is not fully giving attention toward its neighboring countries in terms of resolving past history. So if two strangers meet with each other, Japan's, Koreans, and Japanese, they have a fundamentally different picture about their 70-year-long past history. So this one will continuously give us a trouble when we think about military, security, and uh, cultural societal uh, relations between Japan and Korea. So second question. If a complete resolution between these two countries on history is impossible, how much cooperation can the two countries achieve on their issues? As Kimura Khan mentioned, uh, 
One issue will be China. The other issue will be North Korea and Korean unification. Third one issue will be FTA and economic relations. On China, there is no doubt among strategists of Japan, Korea, United States that very close and uh, formidable security collaboration among Seoul, Tokyo, and Washington would be a win-win game for each of these three countries. That is a common sense. The problem is a China's weight on Korea, on Japan, and US is different across mm. economic and security issues. And relatively speaking, Korea's anxiety and zeal and Korea's uh, importance for this trilateral tie could be uh, relatively weaker than Japan and Washington. But that, that does not mean that Korea is leaning toward China because Korea they need a fundamentally very robust bilateral relationship with the United States in order to handle North Korean threat and prepare for future unification. So what I'm saying is that a, if Korean and Japanese leaders can find a very good balance between public perception and its strategic need, I think there will be a, enough room for these three countries to reinforce their security ties with each other. North Korea, Korean people believe Japan's collective self-defense with Australia and United States is more a threat or more an uncomfortable issue than a welcoming a factors, a handling Chinese and North Korean factors. I think this is not right, but it's up to future leaders and uh, future policymakers, again, how to uh, clearly and easily understand a Korean people to accept that Japan factor could be a very a welcoming and positive a factors when we when they a, think about a changing North Korea and also the unification between North and South. Finally, the TPP will uh, make a positive stimulus for Japan and Korea to reopen their FTA uh, issues, uh, not only bilateral, but also trilateral free trade agreement among Beijing, Japan, and Seoul. It has been a stalemated for the last two years because of different economic structure, and particularly between Korea and Japan, they have some sensitive issues with each other. But as Japanese agricultural market and American automobile industry has been reconciled and opened up through this TPP, I think it will become much more easier for Seoul and Tokyo to speed up their negotiations on bilateral and trilateral FTAs. Of course, there will be some uh, political connotations. So my conclusion is that a, there is a perception gap for Japanese and Korean public on the issues of history and on the issues of strategic collaboration. And there is a, a strategic gap also for Chinese and North Korean leaders. They don't seem to be so afraid of Japan-Korea cooperation because Japan and Korea has been fighting with each other for the last three years. But in reality, you can make Chinese and North Korean counterpart to believe that Japan-Korea relations would be very powerful and sometimes very challengeable for North Korea to think about any further provocation for China to play around these democratic relations. So it's up to future leadership, and that is my tentative conclusion. Thank you. That's terrific. Dr. Kim, thank you very much. That's a great compliment to uh, Professor Kimura's presentation. Victor, let me give you a, a shot at sure. kind of adding an American perspective to this, and then we'll, we'll foster a little dialogue amongst sure. ourselves on this. Uh, well, I won't be too long, Jim, because there's so much that's been put out there. I'm sure there are a lot of 
comments and questions from the audience, let me just make a few points. Um, first, um, really, I think great presentations by both. Thank you, Jim, for doing this, and Tom for this program, past this prologue. I think it's a great program. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of sets of comments. The first is that um, we all know that we're in a, is the first is a perspective of history. We all know that we're in a difficult period in the relationship, as Tejo said, over the past few years. Uh, but if we look at it in the broader context, to me, the story of the Japan-Korea relationship is not how bad it is, but how good it has been despite all of the historical problems and difficult issues between them. Um, uh, in many ways, as Tejo mentioned, it was a forced marriage in 1965. Uh, when neither side was really ready. Um, and uh, in spite of that, if you look over the past 50 years, there's been more, there's actually been more periods, and you could probably code this, there have been more periods of cooperation in this relationship than there have been friction. We've just had a very bad period now the past three years, and that's why we focus on it so much. So that's the first point I wanted to make. The second, I think, from a US perspective is that for the most part, I think the U.S. default policy has been to, uh, you know, to certainly try to encourage, persuade, uh, in some cases coerce as much cooperation as possible between Japan and Korea, and among, among the trilateral, uh, the trilateral alliance relationship, has U.S. policy has always been to try to push for that and try to stay as stay away, keep an arm's distance away from the difficult bilateral slash territorial slash historical issues uh, between, uh, between the, uh, the, the two countries. Um, <clears throat> and so I think in many ways the U.S. view has been we accept as Kimura-san showed in his graph that there is this baseline of his history and difficult issues in the bilateral relationship. It is always there. It is never going to go away. And from an operational policy perspective for the United States is how do you continue to manufacture, promote pragmatic cooperation in spite of that baseline of differences? Occasionally, that baseline will erupt, and it will mar pragmatic cooperation, as we saw on GSOMIA and some other issues. But for the most part, I think operationally, US policy has always been how do we forge that pragmatic cooperation, knowing that it's very difficult to resolve the histories between the two countries. And so in that sense, it's not that different from Europe or other places where um, there still is a baseline of history in the French-German relationship and other relationships in Europe. But the, the operative factor has always been how do you forge pragmatic cooperation in spite of that. Um, so the, for me, the question is then, when does that baseline rise up? and disrupt the pragmatic cooperation, mm -hmm. right? If there is this constant baseline, I think it was the, the, gray, the gray area in Kimura-san's graph, you know, when does that rise up? And so contrary to, and I have specific comments on Kimura-san's paper, but contrary to the argument that it is about the, the, the degree of trade dependence that South Korea has on China, I think that probably, um, the most important factor, and, and unfortunately, I don't have a scientific explanation for this, but the most important factor to me, again, again based on studying this relationship and, and, and working on it in government, is the, the most important factor for when history starts to mar the pragmatic relationship is when one side or the other tries to change the status quo. Right? The status quo is not satisfactory to anyone. It's not satisfactory to Japan. It's not satisfactory to Korea. But it is the status quo. And whenever there is an attempt by one side or the other to change it, that's when you get a real terrible spiraling of the historical issues. Now, you know, the education ministry's approval of textbooks, that's not changing the status quo. That is cyclical. That happens all the time. Takashima Day, that's cyclical. That happens all the time. <coughs> but when you have things like the South Korean president visiting Tokyo, right, Takeshima Island, that was a change in the status quo because it now set a precedent for every future South Korean president to, to maybe have to do that. Right? Or when there are intimations early on in the Abe administration about uh, reinterpreting the Kono Statement. 
right? Or the Murray, I'm apology, uncomfortable. And that, again, intimates, suggests the changing of the status quo, and I think that's when you sort of get the really the bad dynamics that come out of that. Having said that, I think that um, uh, we, you know, we are sort of on a positive incline now. I think the relationship is getting better, certainly at the, at the bureaucratic level. There's uh, all the um, uh, bilateral dialogue is back on track. It's all back on. Uh, the, the only piece that's missing now is sort of the summit meeting uh, between the two leaders. Um, you know, there are opportunities. There was a meeting at UNGA, and there are a lot of opportunities <coughs> coming up, whether it's the CJK summit in Seoul, uh, G20, uh, 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 the Paris meet, climate meetings. There are, there are a whole bunch of opportunities for uh, these two leaders to meet, uh, to meet on the side. So um, I think that it's going to get better. It's not going to get worse, provided nobody does anything to try to change the status quo again. Um, in terms of the, um, the, 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 the future, there's sort of two points I want to make. The first is, to me, the, the most difficult issue right now in the Japan-Korea relationship um, is not Korea's growing trade dependence on China, because I think there's data there to show why that doesn't affect Korea's strategic alignment vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Japan. To me, the most difficult issue right now is we've seen a shift in uh, Japanese opinions on Korea. Um, and one in which you could almost say that Japan is starting to strategically write off Korea as being less important. And we, saw it, we see it in the ministry white papers and these other, other sorts of things. Um, in the past, we've had difficult periods in the bilateral relationship. We haven't seen that, right, where there has been a shift in public opinion. You know, Japanese public opinion takes a long time to move. But when it moves, it moves decisively. And I think the, the, the biggest casualty of this three-year difficult period has been a shift in public opinion in Japan, as Kimura-san's polls show. And I think at the policy level, a, um, a sort of writing off uh, Korea's strategic importance. Right? And how you shift that back, I think, is a big issue. It's a big issue. It should be a big issue for the United States. It should be of something concern uh, to Korea. Mm. And I think from a Japanese perspective, the biggest concern going forward is to try to, uh, uh, to understand, uh, to get a better understanding of uh, Korea's view on China. Right, which I think folks have already mentioned. Um, um, I, had, I wrote a piece for Foreign Affairs this week where I, I said that um, President Park's visit to the um, Victory Day celebrations of the Chinese in September, uh, on September 3rd, was not so much about gravitating away from Japan and the United States, but was about a new type of diplomacy that she was trying to implement, basically a trilateral diplomacy that was really focused on trying to bring the United States, China, and Korea together, right? I mean, because she met with Xi Jinping on September 3rd. Xi Jinping came here September 25th. She's, she's going to see Obama October 16th. The CJK summit is going to take place at the end of October. This, I think, is all part of an effort to try to forge, on her part, better cooperation among the United States, Korea, and China with regard to, to North Korea. Um, and so again, I don't think what's driving Korea's gravitation towards China is trade dependence. I think it's much more strategic, and it's much more about North Korea. It's not at all about Japan. It's much more about North Korea. Having said that, right, having said that, um, there are two issues. The first is if this trilateral effort is about US, Korea, China cooperation in building more strategic cooperation in Northeast Asia, you know, apropos the NAPSI concept, you can't do that without Japan. Right? You cannot build a, a vision for Northeast Asian co-op. Korea cannot build a vision for Northeast Asian cooperation without Japan. Right? Um, and the second piece of this is um, 
the, the honeymoon in Korea-China relations, I think, is interesting. It's important. It's significant. Um, but it really, the honeymoon has not been tested. Because right? the real test of uh, the engagement with Xi Jinping will be when North Korea does the next provocation. Uh, because I would argue, and Taehyung was there, so he could say better than I, one of the reasons why the uh, Korea-China relationship was bad after 2010 um, between uh, South Korea and China was because of Chunan and Yongpyeon, where the South Koreans looked to the Chinese and the Chinese sat on their hands, right, did nothing. And that really created a bet. So the Park Geun-hye, Xi Jinping relationship has not been tested in that way. And so, again, for Japan, I think as they look at what Korea is doing with China, these are the two big obstacles or questions that they have to think about. You know, um, where does Japan fit in this vision of Northeast Asian regional cooperation of parks, and the degree to which the next provocation by North Korea is going to test the, the Park Geun-hye, um, Xi Jinping uh, relationship. Just the final two points I'd make with regard to the data that Kim san presented was um, the, I think what's interesting is, I mean, there's, he's drawn interesting correlations between the degree of trade dependence and, um, and Korea-Japan relations. The, the alternative variables would be um, democracy, mm, yeah. right? Because you, you really start to see these issues coming up with democratization in Korea, right? It correlates very well with your data. From 1987, the 90s onwards, you start seeing these issues um, arise. Um, and then um, the second point would be that if, if the argument, Kim san's argument is correct, the counterfactual would be, so suppose Abe does address the comfort women issue. Suppose some of these historical issues are addressed. According to your argument, then, it would still not lead to an improvement mm. in Korea-Japan relations yeah. because your primary variable is trade dependence, mm. right? And so that, I think that's an interesting question for us all to ponder. Do we think that if, um, if Japan actually did things to try to um, address for, in a straightforward fashion these historical grievances and issues, do we think that would lead to an improvement in bilateral relations, or would mm. we still continue to have bilater difficult bilateral relations because of Korea's growing trade dependence on Japan. Um, uh, I'm less convinced of the latter, but, uh, but I think it's still, it's certainly, uh, it's certainly debatable. Terrific, terrific. Thanks so much, Victor. Um, before, I, I want to give our panelists a chance to, to respond there, and I, I want to entertain a couple of questions, because I've got a variety of thoughts going through my head right now. Before I ask Dr. Kim and Dr. Kimura to, to respond, let me add a little bit to this. So Victor, you're talking a little bit about this idea of changing in status quo as being a key trigger on the history issues, um, related issues. Uh, the, so to some extent, that would, that would suggest the kind of rise up in this um, baseline of, of, of historical different perceptions that are, that are always there. Um, part of what Kimura Sensei was talking about is, is almost that stays constant, but what is fluctuating is the level of importance or the, the, how much each other need each other or, mm. or the, the level of importance of, of each country. And so it's almost kind of dipping down beyond below that as, as a key issue. Uh, together, there could be a bit of both, frankly. Change in status quo could, could kind of rise um, the, the level, the political level up above, uh, importance level of the other country, um, but, but that, that level is always there. A related issue in my mind is, and it, it comes out in, in the Cold War example and discussion about that era, uh, and the relationship to the United States. So some have argued that, actually paradoxically, the fact that Korea and Japan need each other so much, that all this interdependence that has evolved actually allows them to engage or, or entertain historical disputes because they know that if it gets to be really bad at a certain point, people are going to come in and sort things out. So in a way, this interdependence and this, these relationships with the United States insulates or, or at least make, makes some uh, leadership and, and media perhaps and others feel that they, they have license or, or the ability to do this. Others say um, 
actually the opposite. You know that that uh, that, that this this interdependence or, or this these re strong relationships with the United States actually helped mitigate and and reduce the the, the level of of, um, of conflict on these issues. I wanted to ask the panelists if you wanted to respond to to some of the points that Victor made, but also to to respond to this idea about. Um, the U.S. role or the alliance mm. role, because in the in the Cold War versus the '90s, if the if the Japan-Korea relationship was actually moving in a in a strong, good direction in the '90s, whether it was '93 in the Kodo Statement and the Moriyama Statement and the 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 um, Obuchi Kim meeting and and that that trend that we had in the '90s, that would suggest at a time when threats and other things were not necessarily as, uh, as, as critical, and you could argue they didn't need each other as much, then why were things so good then? Um, I'm trying to, to understand that era in the context of some of these issues about change in status quo or relationship with the United States, sense of threat, et cetera, if you understand what I'm, what I'm getting at. Does anybody want to take a stab at why the at, at, at those relationships. Well, let me. I'll, I, I think that in in terms of your first que question and comment, Jim, I think the the um, I think it can be a combination of both things. I mean, I think the reason things have gotten as bad as they have is because in the bilateral relationship, uh, there are efforts to change the status quo. Whether it was the Tokto visit or Kono statement, mm -hmm. the Kono statement, there were efforts to change. You know, on, or intimations to change on both sides. And that, that made the relationship worse. And then at the strategic level, um, you know, I think the, the basic observation there is that, and, and, and that for disparate reasons, the Koreans and the Japanese just don't value each other strategically mm -hmm. as much as they used to. You know, the, for, um, the, for Japan, you know, you see it in the white papers and they clearly see the answer to being the, the focus is now on the East China Sea and the South mm -hmm. China Sea, and that the primary partner there is the uh, more reinvigorated U.S.-Japan alliance, and to the extent that we can get other, other partners in Southeast Asia and, and else India and others on board, that's the focus. And for Korea, the shift has been away from Japan and towards China as a strategic partner in managing this very difficult and unpredictable North Korea problem. So in many ways, the two are looking away from each other. Mm -hmm. And for the United States, that's very frustrating because we think that the two really need each other. And we treat, in fact, the trilateral relationship as a st single strategic unit, as you know well, in our own thinking and planning, both politically and operationally. So in that sense, I think both of those things are happening at the same time. And I think the status quo issue, the bilateral one, has been, I think we're coming out of that now. I think hopefully we're coming that. Uh, but the big problem going forward, right, as Tejo mentioned, is the strategic picture is still a big problem because, you know, Koreans are looking at China and Japan is looking at the South China Sea and neither feel like they need each other as much as they used to. Any comments from... Okay. okay. Uh, oh, please. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I don't know. I want to say that uh, sometimes uh, we you know, tend to just focus on the China problems. But now uh, you know, I think that there is another problem in North Asia. That is ja Japan problem. Because that, you know, the, you know, now, now Japanese government and the Japanese public opinion have a very a strong anti-Chinese, anti-Korean sentiment. It means that you know, uh, we are losing the sense of the uh, place of the directions in the Northeast Asia. North East Asia. We don't know where should we go. So, you know, so, so the, you know, the Abe government's policy to try to make a strong you know, network with the United States is strongly supported. It means, that, it means that because we are losing the, the, the place in Northeast Asia, so we are trying to go back to Pacific. Uh, you know, the, I think that the same kind of thing is also happening in, uh, in South Korea. You know, South Korea also, also the, the you know, policy makers and uh, uh, scholars of the uh, strategic issue insist that, that they are putting a very much emphasis on the relationship with the United States. But uh, you know, they are living in the situation, they have to care about a very big Chinese influence. 
they don't know how to do that. They don't know how to that, do that. And especially, you know, Japan has a very strong military power and very economic power. So uh, Japan, you know, the society has a big anxieties. So anyway, you know, and, uh, this is another thing, one of the big problems in the uh, today's world. How you are going to treat all the economic power in Northeast Asia? Like, you, you, you can expect the same role as you expect the call at the time of Cold War to Japan. But uh, you may, you know, uh, locate Japan in, the, in other new powers, like South Korea or Australia, something like that. You know, frankly speaking, we are not sure about what kind of things you expect or what kind of the uh, future picture of the strategy and how you locate the Japan in the very broad pictures. So that's the one with the big problem in North, in North Asia. So, uh, you know, so I want to say that we are floating, floating in North East Asia. And uh, another point is that, you know, the, the I miss uh, my presentation is the uh, change point, changing point of the, the, the situations. I understand, you know, according to the data of GG News, you know, the number of the people who answered that South Korea is an important partner, partner started to decrease in 2002. It means that, you know, you know, you know partly it is because that we had a World Cup football game, football game at the time. But the other one is it was the starting point of the populistic era in Japan and South Korea. So after the Koizumi government, the Nomhyun government, no, you know, imagine a situation at the time of Mori government or Kim Dae-jun government. They don't uh, try to touch positively about the uh, history issues by their own choice. But uh, uh, from Koizumi and Nomhyun, they pick up. In case of Koizumi, it was Yasukuni. And uh, in case of the Nomhyun, it was Sakishima Dokuto. The, the South Korean people might know that uh, uh, you, know, you, don't, you couldn't see the, any big poster of the Takeshima Dokuto before 2001. But just that soon after the 2005, the many of the pictures, the movies, and the PDB programs started to be broadcasted. You know, you know, they found that that kind of issues can be, by doing that, by using that, they can get some kind of political or economic interest. So after the, after the timing, our situation has changed. So, uh, and of course, behind that, you know, we are in the very the hard situation of the decline of the trust, of, or the decline of trust or confidence in politics. You know, uh, so now we are, you know, very, how can I say, <laughs> uh, unstable situation. That's the things that we have to cover. Okay. Yes. Uh, Victor made a lot of interesting and uh, convincing uh, cases, and uh, I have just two responses. One about the strategic gap among US, Japan, and Korea. I think US is a no doubt a global power. So US look at Northeast Asia in terms of its global strategy, balance with the Syrian case and how to deal with Putin. And uh, uh, next month is how am I approaching Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party in terms of various different things in the world. But Japan and Korea are still, I think, a regional uh, context they are moving around. Japan worry about East China Sea issue, and uh, they pay more attention to South China Sea. But relatively, Korea uh, uh, pretty much focusing on the peninsula issues and uh, China involvement with any uh, Korea-related issues. So in other words, Seoul and Tokyo has been, have been competing with each other to get their own exclusive attention from the United States. That's right. And paradoxically speaking, a US allow, alliance has been functioning too well for the last 70 years. That is why uh, Korea and Japan has been so lazy about their security strategic approaches to their alliance. My second comment is about uh, Chinese, uh, Japanese and Korean people's uh, discomfort toward their mutual history. Victor mentioned about the status quo and the breakdown of the status quo and its correlation with a practical cooperation. 
uh, in a broader picture, I agree uh, with that argument. But uh, if you look at the same social phenomenon with a more myopic angle, there is no static and fixed social phenomenon in the world. It's slowly changing. So from the Korean eyes, a, Japan has been applying salami tactics. There was no Takeshima day in 20th century. Suddenly, uh, it appeared. And then there was no textbook description about their claim on Dokdo before seven years ago. So for Korean eyes, everything is changing, but very slowly. So it reinforces Korean people's perception that still Japan is approaching the past history in the same angle. And from the Japanese people, uh, I think Japan has some problem with a Korea's a inconsistent argument in international realm and also their uh, domestic political procedures. And uh, Japan have witnessed a different ruling from Korea's Supreme Court and local court mm. on forced labor issue, which they believed already has been completed and resolved with Korea in 1965. So many Japanese people reading uh, these issues out of their magazines and uh, news media, they believe that uh, Korea is moving the goalpost. Mm. And for the last three years also, these two countries have, have been uh, squirreling and uh, moving, the, bringing this issue also outside of the Northeast Asia. So mutual just has been, distrust has been deepened. So as Kimura Khan already pointed out, a Japan public's rapid shift toward anti-Korean for the last three years is much more challenging issue we have to tackle between the Seoul and Tokyo from now on. There are a lot of marriages and divorces, but uh, this kind of divorce is more often in Japan than in Seoul. Wife, don't say any complaint, and just diligently serving their children and, and husband for 40 <laughs> years, and suddenly one day announces yes, yes, unilateral yes, yes, divorcement yes, yes, yes. and uh, <laughs> asks for claim yes, and budgetary yes. compensation. That's more often in Japanese, uh, for <laughs> Japanese wives. So that kind of phenomenon is happening in Japan <laughs> right now against Korea. <laughs> Thank you. So in Korea, they're just arguing for the last 20 years. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Well, I, you know, and I suppose to finish the thought on the, on the Cold War piece, that it, it jives with, with Victor's uh, work that he's done in the past. I mean, you could argue, even if the threats were decreasing, there was also a threat of US disengagement from, from the region. And in, a sen in that sense, Japan and Korea needed each other more, potentially, as a, as a hedge against possible uh, abandonment fears, so that, that could have been a factor, all of which in my mind reinforces the idea that in the past, the bilateral dynamic was incredibly important, um, the, the relationship with the United States and other bilateral relationships. We could be entering an area where the multilateral, it, it's a more complicated picture, as, as mm. Victor and others were alluding to, um, and how we, fact, how we bring China and Southeast Asia and other countries and institutions into this relationship, I think may be something we need to think about going forward, because it's not just about um, bilateral relations are still important, but, but that's not all there is. Democratization of foreign policy issues is another trend in the back of my mind, which I won't ask about right now, because I want to get to the audience. Um, the role of the media, globalization, technology development, these are all other factors that have evolved over time in the past 50 years that I think we have to think about going forward in the next panel about um, how they may impact uh, some of these modalities that, that, that we've talked about today. But let me open it up uh, to the floor. I, 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 saw, I saw Jim's uh, hand here first, and I, I want to hear from him, and then, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go around and hear. Please let us know who you are and, and where you're um, from. Jim, Jim Bristop, National Defense University. I wanted to build on um, the observation about efforts to change the status quo leading to these spir downward spirals. And to ask our panelists to kind of identify what are the domestic political drivers that led to decisions that to, for example, uh, to visit uh, Tokdo, uh, for example, what caused Abe to start considering revisions of the Kono and Murayama statements? Mm. That what is the political, domestic political payoff 
that overrides longer term security interests uh, that lead to these uh, kind of controversies. So some, some quick thoughts about domestic drivers of, of some of these decisions? Japan. Okay. Japan and Korea. Korea breathes first. Okay. <laughs> Three weeks earlier than former President Lee's visit to Dokdo, Trisomia agreement was on hold suddenly, and I resigned. And then without me, he didn't have any challenger to stop visiting Dokdo. But it was his three-year-long wish. I heard him saying, I need to go there for several times since 2008, which means that he believes a Japan is strengthening their description on Dokdo in their textbook. And I have been uh, quiet on that issue so far. And Japan, I don't know about other issues. We are very good. But Japan is taking advantage of my position here. That was President Lee's belief. And problem was that a, he, uh, similar time frame, he made some uh, informal lecture in front of high school teachers. And then some teacher, end of the session, questioned that, what do you think about Japanese emperor's uh, possible visit to Korea sometime in the future? And then he answered like a textbook style. We have many, many difficult issues, so I welcome him. And then I wish he could make some a good apology, again, as an emperor for our bilateral relations. But it was spilled over, then uh, became a bigger issue. And then uh, Japan picked up uh, very sensitive uh, words out of it. Uh, that was the beginning of the relationship. But that cannot approve this government, uh, Park geun government argument that everything about this difficult relationship uh, has been a inherited from the previous government, uh, I don't agree with that argument. Because at least for the last two and a half years, both governments, leadership from Abe cabinet and Park Geun-hye regime, had a lot of opportunities and chances to fix or turn the direction around. So bad incidents, many, happen, many, many things happen and aggravate it. So always, you should carefully gauge uh, what can you do during your five-year term presidency and during your a uh, prime minister's a uh, period. Mm. Thank you. I guess we also have to think about this idea that there's changes in the status quo, but there's also the challenge of trying to actually move back. There's there's real political cost to moving back, so it's almost mm. like a one-way valve. You know, sometimes is is if things move in that direction, we have, it's hard to bring back. Yeah. Have any thought on the Japan side? Mm, I think that uh, on the Takeshima Doku issue. That uh, we are not you know, necessarily going to the bad directions. As you see, that uh, at the time of the Nomihyun government, Takashima Dokuto was a top issue, top the issue of the dispute between two countries. But uh, now, the, that, uh, the, the South Korean government, you know, the land, you know, they shouldn't pick up the issue so you know, sensationally, you know, in two meanings. We, you, know, simple, you know, first, you know, if they, once they irritate the Japanese, non Japanese public opinions, you know, they cannot take the, something, anything from the uh, negotiation with the Japanese. And the second way is more simple, simply because they are controlling the islands. You know, you know it is nothing for them to, you know, to pick up the issues as international disputes. They cannot take anything because they are officially denying their, the, any disputes on the Takeshima Doctor Island. So, you know, so after the uh, establishment of the Park government, Park Kune government, I think the Park Kune government understands that and try to tone down the, 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 you know, the insistence or maintenance on the uh, Takashima Dokuto Island. And on, in, on Japanese situation, uh, I think that, uh, you know, at Japanese situation more is more complicated. Because originally the, the Takeshima, uh, Takeshima Doku issue was uh, started by the uh, establishment of the day of Takeshima. 
which was done by the uh, Shimane Prefecture government, it means that uh, it did start from the, some kind of civil society or local government. And it's not con just directly controlled by the central government. Of course, there are so many politicians who are supporting such kind of activities. But uh, I don't think that uh, even, even today that uh, the Takashima doctor is never a top issue for the Japanese uh, government because that, uh, we have more serious ones, Senkaku. You know, comparing with the Senkaku, you know, it is nonsense for us to uh, make the use energy to the Sakisaki Okto. Uh, so, in that meaning, that, uh, you know, on that kind of thing, we are going to gradually control the Takisaki Okto. Uh, because we learn something. We learn something. I have Chris, and then I have a gentleman behind him. Oh, we got a, no, we got a microphone coming. And then we'll work our way back here. We'll try to keep our questions and comments short. Thanks a lot. The, uh, Chris Nelson, the Nelson Report. I want to follow on Jim's uh, question uh, and this notion of the of the real risk point is the, is status quo changing, whether it's going up or down. Uh, as a a uh, media uh, a mere media commentator, I believe was the opening phrase uh, by your your chairman. Uh, I'm on the receiving end of a lot of stuff as you might imagine, and in the last month or two, I've been on the receiving end of a steady drumbeat from uh, Japanese diet men and other people uh, accompanied by Gama Show uh, uh, helpers, not implying agreement, but you know, in full view of, of the government, of blatantly anti-Korean uh, uh, positions and arguments wanting me to really write uh, criticism of Park, uh, her visit to China, et cetera, et cetera, on in the night. And in particular, uh, uh, I was handed by a senior dietman, I guess a week ago, uh, this, you know, this Sankei Shimbom quotes history book that's an embarrassment to the Japanese people, and this book by a Korean woman, uh, again, very difficult stuff, but handed to me, you know, here's the real story. Uh, 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 you need to write about this. And, uh, and asking around, these are being mailed out to people all, all over, uh, perhaps all over the US, but certainly over DC. Are we seeing something here that is really what Abi and the Kantai really wants to happen? Or am I just, uh, because I'm not hearing anything to counter it. I'm not hearing anything from somebody saying, well, you know, normal, sensible Japanese people know this stuff is an embarrassment. Nobody's making that case to me. I'm just getting this extreme revisionist stuff mm -hmm. as what I'm really supposed to be writing about. And it's quite disturbing because I think that if that's really where they're coming from in the Kantai these days, uh, and where, where Abi's really coming from, uh, then that is a, a real status quo mover. And, and by that model, we need to really be worried about it. So the question is... That's my question, is it? Uh, it am I just hearing from the, from the right wings, or is this what's really uh, starting to come out now because of this anxiety about, uh, about uh, the Korea-China uh, relationship? Does anyone have a thought about that? Um, I mean, my impression, just quickly, is... is um, you know, as was alluded to on the panel, one of the recent developments is the fact that this, these historical issues or this, this consistent uh, phenomena between Japan and Korea is, 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 is multiplying, where it's becoming, you know, more outwardly directed uh, by, by both uh, involving the United States but other capitals as well uh, and in the region. And China has its own role uh, in this in this uh, public diplomacy uh, engagement. So um, I, I don't see anything to suggest to me that the, that the cabinet has any kind of role in this or, or I mean, I, I think it's hard for them necessarily to take a position on it one way or the other. I mean, it, um, frankly, I'd rather encourage the depolitization, which means not having diplomats and others going around trying to either correct this or reflect that, but so to me, the absence of criticism of that activity doesn't, doesn't frighten me too much, but I don't know. I think um, there are a couple of points. The first is um, I'm not really sure how much of a domestic political bump these leaders get from uh, being nationalistic on these history issues. I mean, maybe Kim Young-bak got a little bump after he visited Tokyo Take 
Fukushima, but it's not certainly not like the bump, bump Pakane got after she stood down the North Koreans over the DMZ loudspeaker crisis, right? If you want to get a bump, that's that's where you can get a bump. But I think what um, uh, the, on the domestic politics angle, I think what we're seeing more, and this is also to Chris's, what we're seeing more of is the role that these grassroots and individual organizations can play in, in affecting the relationship, right? And increasingly, something that I really don't like seeing is that the United States is now becoming the battleground, whether it's the expat, you know, the Korean, Ameri the Korean Americans doing these monuments, or the mm -hmm. Japanese trying to place ads in the Washington Post, or someone trying to feed you information. The US is kind of becoming the battleground for this. And, and I don't think that's a good thing. It's not a good thing for either country. It's not good for US, US policy either. So. Yeah, right. Anyway, we have a very bad you know, ex, you know, the expectation to the US government, the US, pub, US public opinions, uh, like that the US might say yes to the other side or something like that if we can make an effort. So in that meaning that the American people or American government have to say, you, don't, you are not touching to the such kind of called dispute or territorial disputes, and that you will take, you are going to take a neutral position. Otherwise, we expect some public the public opinion, public opinion, the police expect we like we may be able to move U.S. public opinion, the U.S. policy maker to help to assist our side of the historical understanding. So I think that we need the U.S. understanding. U.S. official standards more clearly about the historical dispute between Japan and South Korea. Well, it shows to me that we need a counter, a civil society counter to this, not necessarily a, a government counter um, to these different opinions. But uh, I have the gentleman here, and then, then we'll move back. Thank you. I'm Gertrude from, uh, uh, I'm a Fulbright visiting scholar from the size of the Johns Hopkins. I have a, I have a very quick question for Professor Kimusa, Kimura, yeah. Uh, according to to Professor Kim's idea about the, we say the Koreans' uh, attitude toward the Japan, uh, is quite stable, yeah. Due to the historical dispute, mm -hmm. according to your presentation, uh, you mentioned about uh, in the recent three years uh, the uh, the percentage of dislike from Korea to Japan dramatically increased. Yes. Yeah, and you didn't mention about uh, the reason. Yeah, okay. according to my understanding about your presentation, it is not because the Korean itself. It is because of, uh, it is due to the rising of China. Yeah, that is, uh, in uh, Japan's mind, uh, Koreans should be on Japan's side, viewing China as a threat instead of uh, uh, establishing a closer relationship with China. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so in my, to my understanding, it is just uh, Japan is mad about the Koreans' response to China. Is uh, is man standing correct? Okay, thank you. Well, That's my question. Uh, <laughs> as for the you know the dispute between Japan and South Korea, as uh, Professor Chao also mentioned, you know the you know we uh, there are two, two or three elements which affected the situation in the 1990s. First one is of the decline of the Japanese economy after the, you know, the heyday of the Japanese economy. This is first. And the uh, second one is the uh, democratization and the, uh, you know, the starting of the move, civil society movement of the victims at the time of colonial rule. And then until 1970 or 1970s, it, it was very tough for the South Korean people to say, so, to have that kind of movement even against Japan. Because that, uh, uh, until 1991, even about conformity issue, South Korea government had an official, and official stance that the, it was solved by the 1965 treaty. 1965 treaty. But uh, because of the, the, you know, the booming of the civil society movement, you know, after that, South Korean government officially changed the understanding, first on the, on the conformity issue in 1991, and they go back to the, again, the 1993, and uh, again, you know, they deny that you know the the solution of the conformity issue by the 1965 treaty, you know. So in, you know we have that kind of process, and so the one of the things is that you know the if we see that kind of situation in 1990 in micro level, 
almost all of the movement started from South Korea. South Korea. So uh, the situation should be explained in the context of the South Korean society or Japan-South Korean relations. And uh, about China, well, I don't know. I'm <laughs> sorry, but uh, uh, you know that uh, today that uh, you know I know that uh, the Chinese movement of the victims so at the time of the uh, World War II are influenced by the South Korean one. South Korean movement, and they are assisted by the, some kind of the South Korean activists. So, in that meaning, that uh, something starting from South Korea have, you know, has uh, some kind of impact to the Chinese situation, and also the South, South Korean uh, activist experience about how to use the, the how to use the courts or how to use the international public opinions, or even how to use the U.S. courts was you know, used for the kind of the, act the activity of the, in China, and they share that. And also, you know, of course, the uh, decline of, Ch of Japan in, chi in Chinese economy is very important. Imagine the situation after the Tinyamu incident. After the, in the early 1990s, the China, Japan was a very important country for Ch China. But at the time, you know, the so Chinese government tried to control the situation. But uh, uh, now they don't need to do that kind of situation. I just say, and I would say that one of the things we have to appreciate in thinking about this when it comes to China is that just structurally, Korea has a much more nuanced view of China than Japan does, right? I mean, for Japan, Japan, China will always be a peer competitor of Japan, always, right? That's the way it's been historically. That's the way it'll be in the future, right? And, but for Korea, it's always about this managing the North Korea problem, right? Mm. It's the trade dependence issue and it's managing the North Korea problem. So it's always going to be a no, more nuanced relationship. Now, this is not to say, I don't think, this does not necessarily mean Korea is just going to fall into China's orbit. Because there are many tests of that relationship down the road, the most proximate of one of which will be the next North Korean provocation. You know, that will really test the, the Korea-China relationship. And then, and I do think values matter. I mean, I think you know, the bottom line is that Korea and Japan are the two prominent market democracies in Asia and two of the more prominent market democracies in the world. And so that matters, right? I think that matters in the relationship. I'm reminded of a conversation I had with a very senior uh, South Korean official over dinner one night who negotiates with China. He negotiates tra negotiated trade stuff with China. And he said that, um, um, you know, when you have a negotiate, when we have a negotiation with the United States, we negotiate on the basis of logic and reasoning. And if I can make my point clearly and show that it makes the most sense, eventually I can get my American counterpart to say, "All right, well, maybe, maybe that's right." But he says, with China, doesn't matter, right? <laughs> you can you can say why your position is logically right. This, that, and the other thing it has no effect, right? And so that's about values, I think. And, and, um, and I think you know, we underestimate the role that, that can play in the, in the Japan-Korea relation, US-Japan-Korea relation. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, we've, we've run out of time. I know we have a lot more questions here, but we do have a little bit of a break um, between the now and the next session. So there's a chance maybe you can engage with some of the, uh, the panelists uh, directly. Um, there is. Uh, I hope we've we've taken a little bit of the journey toward this this gaining of insight uh, in terms of trying to make more uh, informed, accurate assumptions uh, about the future. There are some constants, uh, but I think there are also some some very dynamic uh, uh, changing factors in the relationship as well. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, our, our presenters and discussing today. Thank you very much.